And joining us right now on the Rothman Orthopedics guest line is a guest that you might know from his decades in Philadelphia media. I started reading him in the Doylestown Intelligencer. Uh, you can read him uh, formerly at Philly.com, now Inquirer.com. And uh, he's also uh, written a book, ladies and gentlemen. This book is entitled Kobe Bryant and the Pursuit of Immortal Immortality, The Rise by Mike Sealski. This book, ladies and gentlemen, has taken him to new heights. I kid you not when I say that. Or new depths. Or new, de <laughs> or new depths. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, he has been on SI.com, been on their uh, podcast with our old friend John Gonzalez, another LaSalle guy. Uh, he has been on the Adrian Wojnarowski podcast, and I believe uh, this Sunday he'll be at the uh, Circuit City in Doylestown <laughs> signing copies. <laughs> I'm going to be on the tower at the Tower Records on the Boulevard. You're going to be on the Tower Records on the Boulevard. Siren Records in Doylestown. Uh, you're going to be all over the place. Just, this book is, I'm, I'm just so happy for you, Mike. I know how hard you work uh, in general. I know how hard you have worked on this book, getting interviews, talking to people, taking all your notes, sorting through it, doing your own podcast, doing your own thing, and then somehow still just cranking out great pieces uh, for the people of uh, uh, Inquirer.com. So just on that, let me just start with, Congratulations. You have earned every bit of this, my friend. Mark, that's very kind of you to say. Congratulations on uh, becoming a father again. That's better <laughs> than anything you just mentioned about me. Um, and as the father of two myself, I say welcome to our world and um, uh, enjoy sleep while you can get it. I, it <laughs> you know, people told me before I became a father, like working in the business, you're, you don't have a set schedule. And they're like, ah, oh, it doesn't matter when you're raising a kid. Nothing had prepared. No, I don't think anything could have prepared me better for fatherhood than never having a set schedule. Like no. that, that is how. Oh no! Like going to sleep at like eleven forty-seven a.m. Like yeah, easy. Like do that all the time. Like <laughs> totally accustomed to waking, going to sleep at eleven forty-seven a.m. or waking up at eleven forty-seven a.m. No problem. Yeah, exactly. And I know if I do that, it's just I just need two espressos and then I'm back at it, baby. Back Darn at it. Darn right, man. Coffee uh, is the elixir of life. <laughs> uh, I, I do, I do want to ask you about the book because uh, it is fantastic, and uh, I look forward to finishing it. It takes me a while to read. Uh, I don't read as good as the other kids. Well, um, I mean, your, your lips can only move so fast. Exactly. exactly. Um, but uh, I, I do want to ask you, that, and I'm sure you get this question a lot, of all the research you did, like, is there a little morsel? Is there something that you hang on to that you, you just still think back on it, go, Wow, like that's like that, that that in particular about Kobe Bryant, something that's not out there in the mainstream yet, still wows you even well after the book has been published and released. Yeah, um, and it might be the least complimentary thing about Kobe in the whole book that I uncovered. Um, I guess it's been out three weeks now. I can say this out loud. I, I uncovered. I talked to um, Kobe's high school guidance counselor at Lower Marion, and he told me a story um, which I was able to verify that. Um, Lower Marion changed its school district's sexual harassment policy in 1996, just before Kobe began his senior year. And so the guidance counselors in the high school were charged with holding seminars to teach students and staff members about the new sexual harassment guidelines. And Kobe tried to walk out of his seminar. Wow. Yes. He got up and said, uh, Mr. Hartwell, the guidance counselor was Frank Hartwell. Mr. Hartwell, I don't need this. And he tried to walk out oh and Mr. God. Hartwell told him to sit back down and, and Kobe did. Okay. Um, but it was one of those things where you find that out and you just kind of go, okay, like on the one hand, you're like, wow. And on the other hand, you're like, okay, this plays into the entire theme of the book, which is, I want to tell the story of Kobe's early life in the hope that if you read the book about his early life, you will understand everything that came afterward. And I wow. think that anecdote kind of symbolizes that. Yeah. It, it's, it, I mean, the title is perfect uh, for, for that type of thing for, for two reasons. One, the pursuit and then the rise, this isn't the plateau. This isn't where we all knew him at. This isn't where he became famous. This was on his way up, literally him rising. So people need to check out this book, of course, yeah. uh, Kobe Bryant and the pursuit of immortality, the rise. And in, and in fairness to those who are Kobe fans, there are a lot of great there's a lot of great stuff about Kobe too. There's the details about his first encounters in person with Michael Jordan. There's some other stuff. Um, but that one really kind of took me aback when I found mm. that out. It, absolutely incredible. Uh, like I said, I look forward to finishing it. <laughs> uh, but uh, when it comes to our own basketball team here in Philadelphia, I want to touch on this with you here uh, because it couldn't get weirder with Ben Simmons at this point. No. Now new things have been pointed out about Ben Simmons, about how he's 
more so taking umbrage with Joel Embiid than anything that Doc Rivers said after they lost to the Hawks in Game 7 of the Eastern Conference Finals last year, or excuse me, Eastern Conference Semifinals last year. Have you seen anything this weird? I mean, really, I think the only comparison is maybe the Eric Lindros and the Lindros family versus Bob Clark and the Flyers. Other than that, this seems to be on a whole new pedestal. I agree. I, I think this is starting to put the Lindros thin, thing to shame. Um, the only difference is, you know, the Flyers and Lindros back then were much more overt in their dislike for each other. You had Bob Clark saying one thing and you had Carl Lindros, Eric's father, saying something else and sometimes Eric weighing in as well. This is all sort of veiled and surreptitious and sources who are really Simmons agents and handlers and all kinds, you know, whispers from the Sixers and all that kind of stuff. It's crazy, man. This is absolutely crazy. The story by Ramona Shelburne on ESPN.com today. Um, and, and here's the thing. Like, I have two thoughts about this, Mark. Number one is that I don't see how this makes Ben Simmons look any better. Like, I don't understand the, I think Kyle Newbeck made this point on Philly Voice, and it's a good point, and one that I agreed with, which is that if, if Simmons handlers think that, like, have, talking to the media this way and not having him just speak openly is the way to do this, I'm not so sure about that. Um, I don't understand the whole, like, we got to go on sources and back channel this whole thing. And, um, you know, and the, even the details that are getting revealed don't make Simmons look very good. You know, the whole idea, well, Doc Rivers didn't come to visit me after I after he ripped me and blah, blah, blah. Having said all of that, it does not change the equation for the Sixers. They still have to trade him. And as well as they are playing right now, I'm inclined to argue that they should probably do it sooner rather than later because it's becoming clearer that they run the risk of wasting an opportunity this season, right? They've won 15 out of 18. Tyrese Maxey is exceeding, I think, everybody's expectations for the player that he could be in his second season. They can't get better, really, until they move Simmons. Mm -hmm. And even if they get 75 cents on the dollar for him, Boy, that would help them a lot, don't you think? Yeah, and, and I go to Daryl Morey's comments to uh, Mike Missinelli a couple of weeks ago about how, oh, Joel Embiid's playing so great, so we don't need that much to get over the hump in terms of winning the conference. And I'm like, okay, so now you have Joel Embiid playing that well, plus Tobias Harris seems to be getting on track, plus Tyrese Maxey is stepping into his own. So maybe you need even less. So you think about the rest of that percentage that could be filled out with a Ben Simmons trade. You could talk about actually winning the East in that regard. Yeah, and the other thing is, too, it seems to me that Maury, Maury or the people who are kind of backing his long-term play on this, and I, I have no doubt that he wants to stretch this out and try to get maximum return, right? But this is not the only trade he's going to make as the Sixers president of basketball operations. If he makes a trade for Ben Simmons that helps the Sixers in the here and now, is it possible they will that sort of trade would cripple them for three years into the future? Yeah, I suppose, but A, it may not, and B, Maury is not prohibited from making another move in the offseason that maybe doesn't involve, you know, that, that just because he trades away Ben Simmons mean, doesn't mean he has to stop making trades, right? Like, if he makes a trade that he doesn't think is going to help the Sixers into the future, we'll address that. But right now, you have an opportunity, and that was the whole point of the process. It, the, the point of the process wasn't to keep kicking the can down the road. It was to get yourself in a position where you can make a move to win a championship. And they have that ability right now with Simmons. And it seems to me advantageous that they don't even have to get value for him to make a move that could help them win a championship. They could get 75 cents on the dollar and they would be in great position to win the East. With all that being said, what's your gut telling you? Do you think they make a move with Ben Simmons before the, the trade deadline on February 10th? Or do you think this drags into the offseason? I think it more likely drags into the offseason. Yeah, so and I why. think... I think they'll have a right. Sixers fans would have a right to be disappointed uh, if that happens, um, mm -hmm. because I don't think the way they're constituted now, even as well as they're playing, that they would be the favorites in the East. It would be a surprise if they were to beat Milwaukee or Brooklyn. Um, you know, and who knows what's going to happen with Kyrie Irving and the vaccine and the Bucks and all kinds of stuff. But even the Heat. But um, you know, I, I would think that a, a move now would help them a lot this season. I certainly agree. One of the things uh, I wanted to talk to you about today outside of this basketball world uh, is your story today on uh, uh, Inquire.com. It's another great piece by you regarding Tom Brady, the retirement of, I think, 
the greatest athlete of the four major sports we've ever watched. And I know people look at that and they go, oh, athlete, you know, is he really not? Yes, the guy who plays in sports, whatever semantics you want to use there. Like, I'm not looking at him to a high jump, you know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. But everything else, I think he just, he checks every single box there. And your take on it was really interesting from your article here. And I, I want to pay attention to direct people's attention to the middle of this piece from your article, talking about how he came from a relatively humble beginning, a six round pick who Wally pipped an incumbent starter. Like that's the underdog more or less that Philly loves so much. And even though this guy beat the Eagles in one Super Bowl, he lost to him in another with Nick Foles and that amazing story that we'll get to tell for the rest of our lives. He dropped a pass. Nick Foles later caught a touchdown pass. Like he got strip sacked by Brandon Graham, another uh, the franchise favorite or fan base favorite rather. Tom Brady, I think, with all that to this point, has become a guy that I think at the point you're making is has become respected amongst the Philadelphia fan base. I think so. I think that's in the main. Look, you're always going to have people who hate everybody, right? <laughs> Especially in Philadelphia, you know, we, we love our hate, right? Yeah, sure, and, yeah. You know, but the thing about Brady was that I think people respected him and feared him more than they hated him, right? That That separated him from, say the Dallas Cowboys of the 70s, 80s, and 90s, or the Pittsburgh Pirates of the 70s who had that hot and heavy rivalry with the Phillies, uh, or even Kobe Bryant, who a lot of people, in, in, particularly in Philadelphia, did not like because he saw himself as kind of above and beyond Philadelphia, right? Didn't connect with the city. He was from Lower Mary and all that stuff. Right. Brady had these elements that people around here love. He was an underdog story at first and then kind of earned the right to be entitled because he came from being a sixth round pick who was a backup quarterback to being the greatest quarterback, certainly, and probably the greatest NFL player of all time. And I think that, you know, take that Super Bowl example, like you said, the fact that the Eagles beat the Patriots in the Super Bowl, nothing could make that better for Eagles fans, but it wouldn't have been quite the same if they'd beaten the Jacksonville Jaguars. Like the <laughs> fact that they beat the Patriots, Brady, Bill Belichick and the Patriots made it that much sweeter. And yet, think about it. Like, that's the greatest moment probably in Philadelphia sports history. And Tom Brady experienced it seven times more than Philadelphia has. Like that, and, and when you think about it that way, you just kind of got to go, dude, you're the best. Like, <laughs> what can we say? So, so I, I have this problem with the phrase GOAT. Because, like, there can't be multiple greatest of all time. Like, literally, est, greatest. Like, there's everyone else is below. Is Tom Brady the greatest? When you look at the four major sports, is he the best you've ever seen? I think he's pretty close. Mm. Um, not just because of the championships, that he's won more at the premier position in the premier sport than anybody else, but because of the records he's put up, right? Like, he was the first one to throw 50 touchdown passes in a season. Um, you know, look at the numbers. It, it wasn't like he was Terry Bradshaw with the Steel Curtain defense, where there was a discussion about whether Bradshaw was ever the best at his position in the NFL. Um, he did it better longer than just about anybody else. And there's a phrase that um, the old NFL coach, Eric Mangini, who coached you know, on Bill Belichick's staff in New England, uses about Brady, which is that he was a force multiplier. He made everything and everyone around him better, kind of by raising the standard of excellence for the entire organization. And you see that with his two years in Tampa Bay, right? Like Tampa Bay had the same guys on defense with the same defensive coordinator, uh, Todd Bowles, the year before they won the Super Bowl. And they went seven and nine because Jameis Winston was their starting quarterback. You bring in Tom Brady, you go 11 and five, you roll through Drew Brees and Aaron Rodgers and Patrick Mahomes on the way to a, a one-sided Super Bowl victory. And Brady wasn't the total reason for that. He had a, he was seemed to me to be the kind of the decisive factor there, and so I think yeah I think you can make a really good argument that he's the best team sport athlete of all time. Uh, I'm trying to get through at least one interview where I'm not mentioning the name, but to talk about the uh, the quarterback of the Philadelphia Eagles right now, Jalen Hurts. Uh, I'm required by law to ask you. Yes, you are. Uh, we are. Are you, are. Are, you <laughs> are you sticking with Jalen Hurts for next year? Beyond where are you with Jalen Hurts right now? I think it's close. I understand the argument for going after a quarterback like Russell Wilson, especially now that Brady has retired and the number of great quarterbacks in the NFC has been reduced by one. However, the biggest thing that Jalen Hurts has going for him is this number, 1.9 million. That's how much he costs against the salary cap for the 2022 season. And 
in a situation like that, for all the doubts that we all rightfully have about Howie Roseman and his team building abilities, it was a situation like that that allowed him to build the Super Bowl team in 2017. Carson Wentz and Nick Foles didn't cost that much money under the salary cap. The Eagles were able to build a really good team around them. They then got excellent play from Wentz and then from Foles, and they won a championship. I think you you prob I would lean toward giving Hurts next year to see, you know, let's see how many steps forward he takes. And then if you need to address the quarterback position thereafter, you do. I, I understand what that means in terms of passing on Russell Wilson, but I worry about what you would have to give up to get Russell and that weakening the team around him so that you wouldn't be able to take advantage of his excellence. Fair enough and easy enough for me. I'm right there along with you, my friend. Uh, from Inquire.com, author of the phenomenal book, The Rise, Kobe Bryant of the Pursuit of Immortality, my good friend, Mike Sealski. Mike, thank you so much, and congrats again on all the success with the book. Somebody else will tell me about what Woj is like in person when you're just talking to him one-on-one. -on -one. I, I, I don't know He's what the it man. is. I, I, I take it as a point of pride that I was the subject of a Woj bomb. So <laughs> I, I'm putting that on my headstone in my grave as far as I'm go. concerned. <laughs> That's great. Mike Sealski, Inquire.com. Great catching up with you, brother. Thanks so much. Thanks, Mark. See you, buddy.